Very briefly, since it's been a little while uh, since the Easter break started, we're going over the 10 evil traps. And uh, can anybody remember the point I made about what Zimbardo has to do with the Easter message? Can anybody remember? If you, if you look at the story of uh, the crucifixion, what, is, what is, it, is it about? Not the resurrection, the crucifixion. What is it about? Right. The empire and their collaborator. Who's colla what does collaboration mean? Collaboration. To collaborate means to work with. To work with but in a negative sense, to aid the enemy. For example, when the Israelis were here in Lebanon, some people cooperated with them or collaborated with them, and that was considered to be something bad. Uh, today in Western, Eastern Ukraine, excuse me, some people are collaborating with Putin, with Russia. That is then seen by others as being something bad. So collaboration in the essence of the, or the, the the message of the crucifixion, who was collaborating with the Roman occupying army? The leaders of the, of the Jews. And who felt more threatened by Jesus? The Roman, Romans themselves or the collaborating Jewish leaders? The leaders, Jewish leaders. So you have two groups of power elites who create systems or structures in which nobody is supposed to resist. What was the name of the resistance movement at the time of Jesus? Those who were actually practicing armed insurrection. The Zealots. That's where the word zeal comes from, to have a lot of enthusiasm. And the Zealots were always being, the leaders of the zealots were always being arrested and crucified. And at the time that Jesus was arrested, there was a leader of the zealot movement in prison awaiting execution. And what was his name? Barabbas. Barabbas. So, so this is interesting. Who's more dangerous for the collaborators? The zealot, military resistance, the mukawama, if you will, of, the of its day, or the peaceful or pacifist resistance of Christ? Which one was considered to be more, more dangerous? Well, you know the story, right? Okay, which one was more dangerous? Jesus. What does that teach us? It teaches us a lesson about when, when we create structures or systems of oppression and evil, you call this structural evil. What's the difference between, between structural evil and personal evil? We have terms for this. We, we're going we're gonna to use them now. Personal evil. What would Zimbardo call it? Come on, guys. Easter, Easter message. <laughs> when, when an individual is responsible for the evil that he or she does, what's that called according to Zimbardo? It's their character. It's their disposition. Dispositional evil or a dispositional ethics whereas if that's a bad apple what if somebody creates a system in which it's almost impossible to be good systemic evil so structural systems that are set up so what we what we're seeing if you want to take a modern interpretation of the story of Easter what we're seeing are people who created structural evil and we had two ways of, thank you, bravo, no extra credit. <laughs> but still, I owe you forever in my, in my heart, okay. <laughs> so stru structural evil or systemic, evil 
And we see that the people who created the bad barrel, the bad barrel apples, they had two types of resistance to their evil. Violent resistance and peaceful non-cooperation. And which one were they more afraid of? The model of Barabbas or the model of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Now that, that t teaches us something, perhaps, about the ways that we can threaten evil systems or deal with evil traps. Maybe violent resistance is not always the best approach. At least people who create evil traps seem to be less afraid of violent resistance than nonviolent resistance. Why is, non why is violent resistance not really that threatening? How do you deal? Yeah, you, you expect it. And how do you deal with violent resistance? Violence. With violence. And that's a simple tit for tat. What if people are, just by the, way, the very way that they live, undermining or weakening your system? What if they're, they're not falling into the evil trap? What if they're not even interested in your evil trap? What if they go around the trap and, and encourage other people to go around the trap too? Then, the, then it gets dangerous because your traps don't work anymore. Okay, so much for the Easter message. Is that clear for everybody, that point? I mean, don't, you don't have to agree, but if, is, is the point clear? how the crucifixion, the Friday message, not the Sunday message, but the Friday message is about two options of dealing with systemic ethical traps or ethical uh, or systemic evil. Now, if you believe in religion, you have to believe in religion, it exists. But if you, if you are somebody who has a personal faith, we could go further and not just say evil. What, what do people who believe in God call this? When you do something wrong, what's it called? Sin. Right. So you can say structural evil or sin. It's up to you. I mean, I'm, I'm going to put that in, in quotation mark, marks, not because I don't use the term, but because I'm not assuming that everybody agrees. Now, evil is something that everybody agrees exists. But sin, that's also then a question of whether you have faith or not in the divine or the sacred. OK, good. So we've gone through the, some of the 10, we've gone through all the 10 traps. Let's just review them very quickly, since there has been over a week uh, of, of break. Uh, wh on what page are they? 57, right. So, page 57. The first one, let's very quickly. Nor if you talk, you, you, you get an F in the class, right? And no trampoline in the summer. <laughs> that's, the, that's her reward if she gets good grades this year. Is a trampoline, okay. <laughs> I'm a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke, okay, okay. good. <laughs> okay, point one, offering an ideology. Offering an ideology or a worldview mean, am I making noise? No, it's okay. Offering an ideology or a worldview means you have an alternative way of seeing things that fits into your structural evil system. So obviously, people like Hitler or Stalin created alternative ways of seeing the world. Don't get, don't, or don't fall for the assumption that people are, who are evil have no sets of ethical codes. They just switch them, or they put them on their heads. So what a lot of people would consider to be good is bad for someone who's in a Stalinist system or in a Nazi system and vice versa. So creating an ideology which explains everything in your own Interest, point one. Arranging for contractual obligations, verbal or written. We talked about that. The mafia uses this a lot. You get something first from them, and then in return, you owe them your, your life, or at least your, your loyalty. Uh, giving participants meaningful roles. This is important for everyone. The feeling that in a situation, if you're, if you're working towards something, that your part is important. But it's also a way of getting people to f support you who have a feeling that they're not important. A lot of people suffer from the fact that in society they're not respected. Now this can be because they belong to a certain group, which is not considered to be that valuable. Or it can be because of bad luck that they were born into a family that was mean to them or something. It could also be partially their own fault. But in any case, what 
these important roles offer them is a sense of belonging and giving their life significance. So this is also a way of, of, of luring people into an evil trap. Number three, presenting basic rules to be followed that seem to make sense and then you just switch them arbitrarily. Arbitrarily means without real justification, without logical changes in the situation. The example that I gave was the issue in Lebanon between the two-thirds majority versus 50 plus one. And if you remember, you go back a couple of years, one side was pro 50 plus one and the other side was pro, pro uh, two-thirds and then it just switched. The, was there any attempt to justify this using logical arguments? The leaders went on television and said, yeah, we used to think that 50 plus one was important because of the Western tradition and we're following a Western model and now all of a sudden we're not doing that anymore. We're gonna go back to the millet system and the, did they do that? No, they just switched. So switching things back and forth encourages people to follow you blindly. I, don't, I keep on forgetting the saying, I'll give you my blood and my soul and then you fill in the blank, right? So two years ago when I said that, somebody started yelling, I give you my blood and soul, sensing the boost, and I felt the rush of power. And I realized how attractive that must be, right? <laughs> anyway, that wasn't very funny. Okay, altering the semantic, semantics of the act and the actor, these are using terms to make something that's bad look better. Some of you know uh, from 1984, uh, the novel by uh, George Orwell where war is peace and peace is war. But you know what, even more commonly, we don't have ministries of war anymore like they had in World War I. They're now, they're not, they're now called of defense. Um, creating opportunities for diffusion of responsibility. This is something that uh, people do all the time. Children do that when you get caught cheating and you say, yeah, but I wasn't the only one, which basically means what? If other people are doing it, then it's not really my fault. This is a very childish argument, but you'll hear this all the time, that if Muslim business people and politicians are crooked, why should Christian ones be honest? Same argument, diffusing or saying, well, I was working in a concentration camp and I was guilty of war crimes, but I was only following orders. Fi trying find, to find ways of blaming the other. And this is something that leaders will always offer their followers, that if you get caught, you won't have to pay for it. Um, starting the path toward ultimate evil, uh, starting the path toward the ultimate evil act with a small insignificant step. We saw that with the Milgram experiment, very slowly increasing the voltage. That was number uh, seven, gradually increasing steps of the pathway of abuse so they appear no different from prior actions. So you start low and you increase gradually. Changing the name of the influence authority from initially just and reasonable to unjust demanding which elicits confusion. Okay, this is somewhat similar to the other one about semantics. Confusion should be intentional. You sh people should not want to understand what's right or wa wrong because if they start, if they continue logically determining themselves what's right or wrong, what, what, is, what, danger, do, what, what does that, uh, uh, what danger is that for the, for the leader? If the followers are always thinking through the commands, what will they do? This is not something that doesn't, uh, I don't know if they will ask questions. Yeah, they'll, they'll be dissent, they'll, they'll criticize, they'll, they'll refuse to follow orders. So it's, it's important to once in a while do something that really isn't logical, just to get them used to that. And ultimately the final one, making the exit costs very high. And again, we know the, the example from the mafia. Okay, let's go back now to the examples where we left off. We left off with the, um, the uh, Battalion 101, which was which one again? On which page did we have Battalion 101? What is Battalion 101 while we're looking for it? Oh, here we go, on page 60. Battalion 101, can someone explain it? Tends to be a question on the test. Mm. What was the example? What was it about? Yes. Not 
not quite. It was about, it was not at the end of the war, but towards the end of the war, where all of the able-bodied, normal young men were fighting uh, largely on the Russian front. It was about, the, the Nazi Germany was also about to be attacked from the, from the West, but the battle was still against the Soviet Union. Uh, and they recruited a lot of men who were not of draftable age. They were too old to actually fight. So they sent them to Eastern Europe to arrest and execute Jewish civilians. And the trick was that they didn't require them to do it. They said, everybody has to arrest them, but you can voluntarily uh, execute them or not. And by peer pressure, they got good people to do bad things. So, so please go over that in the reading as well. That's where we left off. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, we had the education one as well. The ed education. And this was something we dealt with already with whom? That education does not necessarily make you better. Who? With rest. What he found empirically was that although the assumption is that education, why do people think that education makes you more ethical? You learn discipline, does that make you more ethical? What, do, what does education give you that could give you a chance to stand up to evil? Knowledge. Knowledge. So when people are saying, do this, that's what everybody does, you can say. I mean, you probably know this when you were a child and your parents told you to dress this way, do that, go to church or to the mosque or whatever, and you didn't want to. You had, uh, you had a binary situation. You could either go along or you could not go along. Not go along is not an alternative. It's just the zero for the one. Binary zero one is computer code, right? What an alternative does is it offers you zero one zero one two, zero one zero one three, zero one, which of course breaks the whole system down. So what education could do would be to give you information and I'm I experienced this myself, and I know a lot of people did. They go off to university, they learn about different ways of seeing the world, and when they go home to their family and their family says, this is the way we do it, you can say, well, that's not really true. There are lots of different ways of living in this world. This is not usually the problem in Lebanon because there are so many realities already existent within the country. I was just uh, up in Akkar in a small Maronite town called Kerzla. Kerzla. You know it? Yeah. yeah? Oh, two people know it. Okay. It's like really a very small town in the middle of a lot of uh, olive groves. And uh, we have a, a, a center there because there's a huge number of, obviously, this being Atkar, a huge number of Syrian refugees. And normally the population of refugees is higher than the population of the villages. And this just accentuated the situation because you have, in, in Akkad, you have a Maronite reality, an Orthodox reality, a Sunni reality, an Alawite reality, which is not that common for the rest of the country. And then you have two Syrian realities on top of that, which are pro-Assad and pro-rebels. And so th these, this multiplicity of Options is something that we're used to, but education offers you an insight into alternative ways of seeing things. Why does that not necessarily make you better or make you more ethical? The assumption is if people get education, then they won't follow people around. Do people with high levels of education in Lebanon stand up to powerful leaders more than people without education? No. Not necessarily. So what Rest found was that education can just make you better at being good or better, better at being evil. So uh, this is the point being made by Zimbardo that the educational system is one of the most important elements for brainwashing. What's brainwashing? Don't say it's washing your brain. What does brainwashing mean? Makes, 
it's, 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 yeah, it's using, using overwhelming methods. When you change somebody's thinking, not through rational argument or discourse, but by overwhelming them with input. For example, if you keep on seeing negative images with respect to a certain group in the country. Yeah, a very, a very, very powerful form of propaganda. And what brainwashing does is it creates, I, by the way, I put the, uh, the, the, the quote from the Iliad in the, on Facebook. Did anybody see it? Yes. Some people, I think about 10 people saw it. At least I saw they opened it, right? So what is the, what is the counter brainwashing, if you will, method that Homer uses? We talked about it uh, on uh, Wednesday. What, do you, what did, what did, what did uh, Homer do when describing who was, who was talking now in that, in, that, in, that discourse, in that discourse, in that dialogue? Who was talking? Uh, Achilles and? Hector's, Hector's Abu Hector. Priam. Priam, right? Priam, Abu Hector, right? Because Abu Hector wants to bring his body, his son's body back to bury it honorably, right? I'm talking about the text that I uploaded on Facebook that we talked about in class on Tuesday. You weren't here? Tuesday? Yeah. Last, before Easter. You weren't here, right? Okay. So what, what method does Homer use to make it difficult for us to hate the Trojans as Trojans? What was the term that I... Look in your notes. No, you don't know. You weren't here. You saw the movie? That doesn't help. It's a theoretical term. What's it? Character development. It's the exact opposite of brainwashing. When you see your enemy, we're always going to have enemies because there's evil. People are always going to, believe me, there's always going to be someone around to make your life miserable. So when, when you see your enemy as something flat, as a member of a group, oh, these people are just mean because they have a certain skin color, they speak a certain language, they have a certain religion, you flatten them, you use brainwashing. But if you have character development, then each individual, as in the case of Priam and Achilles speaking about growing up, about the love of father, the love of mother, the love of homeland. You can no longer hate Priam, although he is the enemy, he's a Trojan, because he has such a strong love for his son. He has such a strong love for his city. He's a person whose character is fully fleshed out. You can't hate that person. He can be your enemy, but you can't just say he's a, he's a symbol of evil. So brainwashing and what um, and Sambardo is describing here is something that flattens characters and makes them simply a member of a group. Another type of evil trap. Okay. The Stanford Prison Experiment, we've talked about that as well. Very, very simply, remember arbitrarily half the people who volunteer for the experiment are guards, half are prisoners. And the tr there's two important points here. One is if, um, maybe I'm, I'll just point it out. Two important things for the test, if you will. Uh, one is, what is the distinction between the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment carried out by Stanley Milgram? What is the major difference? In the Milgram Experiment, the, the subject didn't know the Right. It's unethical. And everybody today would admit, and it's one of the, usually one of the examples, is the sound still on? Is the sound still on? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, every day, everybody today, and it's often used as one example of unethical research because there was no knowledge on the part of the people who were being experimented on what was actually happening. It was unfair to them to not tell them that they were going to be tested to see whether they could torture people or ultimately kill them. And there was basically no follow-up. Once, once the people had killed somebody, they were just left to suffer more or less. Whereas Zimbardo is very clear in pointing out that they knew what they were getting themselves into. Second point, Milgram never lost control of his experiment. Did Zimbardo? Yeah. yeah. 
He was so sucked into the experiment and its success that he became part of the evil trap himself. He was very, when he reflected on the experiment, and he's a psychologist, so they tend to do that, when he reflected on his own personal response, he realized that he had fallen in his own evil trap. He became part of a system where everybody was just trying to make the system work, and, no, and nobody was any more questioning whether what they were doing was right or wrong. Why did it get, who stopped it? His girlfriend who walked in off the street after 10 days, who wasn't sucked into the trap and saw everything for what it was. Okay, so much for that. The rest of it you can go over yourself. Okay, the evil of an action. Edmund Burke, who knows who Edmund Burke is? No completely educated engineers who know all the... Edmund, Ed, Edmund Burke. <laughs> it's a challenge for them, throwing it out to the engineers. Who's Edmund Burke? Don't Google it. He's Googling it. Okay, Ed, <laughs> Edmund Burke wrote a book. Please write this down. Red, Edmund, Bo, Bo, book, Bo, Edmund Burke wrote a book in... 1790. 1790 is one year after which event? The outbreak, the outbreak of the French Revolution. Edmund Burke is reflecting on the French Revolution and that's why the book is called Reflections on the Revolution in France. It's easy to remember, right? So if I write, if I ask you which book did Edmund Burke write, in question two, and then later on in question nine, I wrote, I ask, who wrote Reflections on the Revolution in France? I do that sometimes, if you noticed. Uh, and <laughs> then the answer to question one is, two is question, yeah, and, okay. Anyway, what Edmund Burke was doing was looking at the French Revolution and at some of the failings of the king and the Catholic Church and basically blaming them among other things, blaming them for the revolution. Does anybody know why? Why did Edmund Burke blame the French royal family and the Catholic Church for the revolution? Oh, well, there are plenty of kings making people suffer. That's not the issue. Uh, plenty of kings not allowing people to eat. Plenty of kings killing people. Good, okay, there we go, okay, and what was happening? There was a situation, there was a crisis building up, building up, building up, and what do you do as a small, smart leader when a lot of resistance is building up? You try to calm it down. And what's the easiest way to deal with dissatisfied people? Satisfy them a little bit. If they ask for 100, give them 10, and say next year you're going to get another 10 and just don't give it to them. What will happen? Forget. They won't forget, but they'll be so busy then saying why aren't we getting the second 10 that they won't really re realize that that was a trick. It buys time. It buys time, right? So that's, this is basically what was happening in England. There were very, very gradual reforms and there was nothing, then there was pressure, then there was reforms and there was nothing back and forth and slowly the British system was forced to reform. In France, it was a complete block. And this is actually what Burke is criticizing, but he's famous in this quote for something else, which are crimes of omission. What does omission mean? To remove, or if I, omission can also mean not doing something, leaving something undone. So a crime of omission, if you see, if you're walking down the street, and you see somebody stealing something from somebody else, what is your responsibility as a citizen? It's not my problem. <laughs> Let him save himself. In most countries, that's considered to be at least some form of punishable behavior, if not a crime itself. You can talk about crimes of omission. You can talk about sins of omission. There's a famous story about sins of omission that I like to use in the more modern version, uh, which is, goes like this. A foreign domestic worker, often known as a maid or a Sri Lanki, uh, comes to Lebanon and works for eight years and saves up her money. She lives way up in the mountains. 
After eight years, she gets paid, and she's on her way to the, uh, to the airport in order to go home. And she sees a man laying by the side of the road, and he looks like he's dying. What is she going to do? Stop, have the taxi stop, or just keep on going to the airport? Question mark. She's from Sri Lanka, so let's say she's Buddhist, right? Backward. A, a wealthy businessman is driving way up in the mountains. You know, sometimes there are people who stop cars and try to steal, their, steal them. So st they stop him, they, they pull him out of the car, they beat him up. They take his car, take everything, throw him on the side of the road and drive off. Ten minutes later, a Sunni sheikh comes by, slows down. Oh, that's bad news. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, a Orthodox priest comes by, slows down. Uh-uh. <laughs> Four minutes later, the Sri Lanka comes by. She stops, puts him in the car, takes him to the hospital. He has nothing because he's stripped naked. She says, here's my money. I earned this in eight years, but just take it and save his life. Who was the better servant of God? The last one. The last one. Do you recognize the story? Yes. yes. The, good the Good Samaritan, right, okay. Now, I, I have an example here of a of a portrayal. Who, who knows who Rembrandt is? Rembrandt. The painter Rembrandt. So I, I always like to show this in class because Rembrandt, uh, Rembrandt was a Protestant. And what, what is the problem that, that Protestants and Muslims have with pictures in Catholic and Orthodox churches? What's, what's the assumption? There's sound, right? There's sound? You can hear me? Yeah. What is the problem with pictures? They, uh, Protestants, it's interesting, here we have an agreement between Protestants and, and Muslims, accuse Orthodox and Catholics of praying or worshiping idolatry. idolatry, right. So one of the things that Rembrandt did is he painted cr Christian pictures in a way that you couldn't pray to them. He put people who were ugly from the street. He'd go out to the very poor areas of Amsterdam, bring people in and paint his pictures from the Bible so that there was no danger of idolatry. So I'm going to pass this around as soon as the lights come back on. And once it's gone around the whole class, we can discuss what Rembrandt did and take a good look at the front of the picture. OK, good. So uh, this is a long time. OK, uh, so the, this, this, the, the reading uses an example of a theology student, somebody who's studying to become a priest. He's studying theology to become a priest, and he's on his way to give a lecture about the Good Samaritan. And this is basically the exam as well. If he, if he does a good lecture, a good sermon on the Good Samaritan, he will pass his exams and he will be one step closer to be becoming a member of the clergy. And he's, a he's in a real hurry because he's late. He passes somebody who says she lost everything, I have to go to the, to the pharmacy to get money for my dying child. Can you help me? I just don't need money. I have to, I need, someone needs to take me there. You, could you take me there and help me save my child? And this theology student has two choices. It's, this is in the reading. He can, he can do two things. He can go take her to the pharmacy and get the medication and save her son's life, or he can go pass his exam on the Good Samaritan. So what does he do? He do both. No. He could be the good Samaritan. He could be the good Samaritan and actually live out what he's about to say in his sermon, or he could not practice what he preaches. Not practice what he preaches. And what do you think he did? He did not practice what he did. He did not practice what he did. The temptation is too great. Um, and so the crimes of omission is another example that uh, Lombardo gives us. Uh, the, the example about torturing, this is one of the examples that is very, very common. It's taken from Latin America, that medical, the medical profession is often sucked into um, the evil traps. When in Latin America we had military dictatorships in Chile, in Brazil, in Argentina, in certain countries in Central America, which, which fascist or mi military dictatorships existed 50 years ago in Europe? No, that's more than 50 years. OK. 50 years, to 2014 minus 50 is what? 64. OK, in the 60s, in the 70s, which countries in Europe 
were fascist or had military dictatorships? Spain, Franco, Salazar in Portugal, and the military dictatorship in Greece. And in, the, in both, both in the cases of Greece, Spain, and Portugal, and in Latin America, the, the health workers or the me medical profession became involved in the oppression. So just pass this, don't, don't talk about this. Wait a, what makes it hard to pray to that image? Have a look at the front of the picture. The Good Samaritan, okay. And once you've noticed it, pass it on. You get it? Okay, then pass it on. Okay, good. <laughs> In summing up, what Zimbardo notices is that the overwhelming majority of people, when really cornered, fall into evil traps. But, we talked about this before, what, what do we also notice? Right, there are a significant number of people, more than just a statistical outlier. It's not like half a percent, it's like 10, 15 percent, which is statistically significant, who refuse under any circumstances to be pushed into evil traps. So what he's trying to do now is, and this is the whole purpose of his research, by the way, is not to encourage evil, but to encourage us to know how evil works. And then, to do what? To know how to deal with it, and then to find the antidote, the, the, the counter poison. When you're bitten by a snake, what do you do? You take a poison against the poison, the antidote, right? Okay, and we have now the 11 steps that he encourages us to use, and let's briefly go over them and then we can move on to our next reading, which will be the reading that's due on Tuesday. And I'll go over that briefly as well. Did you, get, did you get it? Did you see anything? Okay, good. Uh, so, what are the 11 steps? Let's briefly go over them. We've, got, we've done this before, but just as a summary. But before we do that, now you see where we get the three options. On page 66, he describes dispositional, situational, and systemic. These are three uh, models that uh, Zimbardo is famous for developing. Why does he put so much emphasis on the second and third? Does everybody agree? Okay. Okay, the perpetrator, the person who has done something wrong, will like to blame it on the situation. But if we look at power systems, if we look at structures, normally when people, when you see an assassination or something horrible happening, what is the tendency of the people in power to do? To blame it on the system or on an individual? individual. Who said system? Why? They are the system. The people in power are the system. They're not going to blame themselves. They blame an individual. And it's, it's interesting that, uh, that uh, Philip Zimbardo was actually a key witness for the defense for one of the low-level guards at Abu, Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, basically trying to say it's not the individual prison guards who were very low ranking in the army, they were the lowest rank, and they came from groups in society in the US who were the poorest. Not necessarily black, but from very, very poor white areas in the mountains in the south, for example, where traditionally the only way to get out of poverty was to join the army, join the military. That's also known to happen in certain parts of Lebanon. The only way to, get, to get, in, get out of here is to join the military. So these people, very low ranking in the military, very low status in society, no one's going to be able to help them, so let's blame them. So he's not trying, with his explanation, to remove the, the guilt of the individual. What's he trying to do? Blame it on society. 
is he, tr is he trying to blame it on society? Or is he removing the guilt of the individual? No. No, what's he doing? He's putting it on them and removing from the American people. Okay, very important. Is he trying to remove the guilt of the individual by pointing out the guilt of the system? Okay, this is an important point. A lot of people, and, I, and uh, some of you have heard of Asad Shaftari. Maybe we'll get him to come in and talk. When I gave him this article, he hated it. I, rem I mentioned this in class because he saw this happening, this danger, if you will. That individuals will then say, I'm innocent. It was the bad apples that I got into uh, company with. Or it's the system itself. What's he what he's trying to do is to maintain personal responsibility but to show that individuals are not only responsible for their deeds as individuals, but also for their deeds as groups and as people who make systems. When somebody creates an evil system, do they create it as an individual? No. Do, do individuals create evil systems? Yes. 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 Who created Stalinist Russia? Stalin, Stalin and his friends. Who created Nazi Germany? Hitler and his friends. So he's not saying that individuals are not responsible. He's trying to make a distinction between personal evil, group evil, and structural evil. But he's never, ever trying to remove the individual's role in this and say there's some sort of, sort of a wave of, of pressure that enables, uh, prevents me from resisting. Okay, so. This is very important to keep in mind. It's not about removing responsibility or guilt from the individual. It's about pointing out that individuals are responsible for what they do as individuals, as members of groups, and as in many cases where leaders are involved in creating structures. So I can create a system, I could create a system at university where it's impossible to be honest. If I would do that, who would, whose fault would it be? The system or me? It would still be me. But the, but the people who fell into the trap now are still guilty, but it should be, should be seen that I made it very difficult for them to resist. OK. So we're not going to go over the, um, the, the 11 steps again. Or maybe, no, yeah, I guess we should go over them quickly. And, and we're going to finish up now. What was the homework for today? There was no homework for today? No. Is everybody sure? No? No homework for today? <laughs> I'm playing with your mind. OK. <laughs> so there's no homework for today, but there is homework for Tuesday. And there's, two, there's OK, we'll just, we'll just, since it's after, right after Easter, just read the chapter. And that'll be it. Okay, quickly now to go over the, the points again. One, openly acknowledge errors. Who was the one who helped me spell outlier right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Every time I forget how to spell outlier. So I don't know how to spell very well. So I, if I try to hide that up, or cover that up, then I will have to lie all my life. Okay, so admit your errors. Encourage mindfulness. What does mindfulness mean? What's another word we had for mindfulness? Intentionality. You want to learn intentionality? Become a vegan for a month. What's a vegan? A person who does not use anything coming from an animal. No leather, for example. If you want to do that, you're going to have to be very, very aware of what you're doing. I mean, there's all forms. I mean, uh, some vegans I know, they draw the line at wool. They say, oh, it's OK to use wool, right? So, uh, let's say organic wool. I don't know. But uh, basically, no, you don't eat any animal products. You don't use leather or this kind of thing, and obviously not furs. If you want to be, or just a vegetarian, if you want to be a vegetarian, let's not scare everybody, everybody off. If you want to be a vegetarian, what's the problem with vegetarians, health-wise? What's the risk? They don't get balanced. Who knows? There's 
I think 21 types of protein. Is that correct? Yeah. I was a vegetarian, that was a long time ago. There's 21 types of protein and I think there's eight that our body cannot produce itself. Is that correct? Nine. Nine, bravo. And all nine are in the proper balance in meat. So you need three of one and two of one and if you have too much of one, you can't use it properly. So you need the proper balance of proteins and if you want to replace them, what's the easy thing to do? What's the, what do vegetarians know that you have to eat to replace? You have to eat beans, dried beans, and grain. This is why a falafel is a perfect replacement for meat. It has the chickpeas and the wheat. Every country in the world, by the way, has the falafel version. It's a taco. It's, uh, in, in, the, in the UK, it's beans on toast. <laughs> Everybody has their beans and, and grain food. For the, it's, it's considered, in, in, in Italy, it's pasta fagioli. It's pasta with beans, with the dried beans, not the green beans. Okay, so intentionality means that you really have to think about what you're doing. Intentionality or mindfulness. Three, promote a personal sense of responsibility. No diffusion, obviously. Discourage minor transgressions. What's that again? Discouraging minor tra transgressions. Which theory is that related to? Uh, broken. broken windows theory, guys. Yeah. A lot of you weren't here on Tuesday before the Easter break, so please remember the broken windows theory. I'm not going to go through that. You can find it in Wikipedia. For your papers, just as a reminder, when can you use Wikipedia for your papers? Always. No. <laughs> I'm not, I don't go to the other extreme. Always Wikipedia. When can you use Wikipedia? When it's fully sourced. And Wikipedia will show you. They'll tell you, don't use this. This is not a proper source. It'll tell you at the top. So, and the people who say that Wikipedia is not a proper academic source, when you ask them how they know that, what's their response? Everybody knows that. So they, do, they have an, do they have a source to prove that Wikipedia does not use sources? No. So they're guilty of this very crime that they're accusing Wikipedia of being guilty of. So basically, they just expose themselves. OK. Distinguish between just and unjust authority. Oh, we had that one, didn't we? What color is this wall? Blue? Is the wall blue? Yes, of course it's blue. Okay. What color is this wall? Is that, was that wall orange? Yes, it's orange. See, she knows. She's figured it out by now. This is what kind of authority? We made a distinction between two types of authority. Authoritarian and authoritative. Again, this is just a review, please. You should have this in your notes. What's the difference between authoritarian and authoritative? Authority can be either Aryan, authoritarian, or authoritative. Authoritative means it's based on merit. And don't say I'm French educated and I don't know what merit means. I use that joke every semester, sorry. Because uh, someone actually said it, right? They said that I, I don't know what merit means, I'm French educated. Uh, merit is a combination of Merit is a combination of performance and experience. Thank you. A performance and experience. Can we have some uh, silencio, some solitudine back there? Thank you. OK. Uh, authoritarian is based on position. I read in the blog that, the, that a stapler was elected president. Did anybody see that? A stapler? Yes. You read it? The stapler was elected president? Oh, no. You didn't read that? Right. Well, it was on a blog yesterday, and then they were saying, well, he can't be uh, president, the stapler. It was on Beauty's desk, and they voted for the stapler instead of. And then someone said, well, that's no problem because the staple, the color of the stapler is maroon. So, get it? It's Maronite, you know. Okay, it's a joke. Okay. 
It was all over the internet yesterday. It was, uh, <laughs> anyway, you didn't, hear, you didn't see it, so it's not funny. Okay, did everybody, did everybody see the picture? How is the authoritarian nature of these kind of pictures undermined, weakened? What, what, what does Rembrandt use to make you realize this is not an icon, but simply an illustration? What is an illustration? A picture, a picture which does what? Which, which argues a case. In your textbooks, as, as engineers or as, as business students, you have illustrations of models of how to build circuits or whatever. These are mainly to just give you a picture of something that's already been described in words. It's an illustration. An icon has a high spiritual value. And so the Protestants thought that it's dangerous that you might actually be tempted to worship them. What does Rembrandt do to destroy the authoritarian nature of pictures? What's he put in the picture? The dog. What's the dog doing? Don't mention it. I tell my daughter she's not allowed to use those words either, right? <laughs> What's the, you didn't see what the dog's doing? He's pooping. He's pooping, right, okay. So, if, if you, if, if you put, <laughs> now she's laughing, because <laughs> she's not allowed to say that. <laughs> so, not one of the students did it. So, this should make a point between authoritarian and authoritative. Okay, guys, please. Authoritative argues a case either through experience or through performance. Good, okay. So much for that point. Uh, just and unjust authority support critical thinking. Now, uh, does anybody happen to know who Paolo Freire is? Has anyone heard of him? Freire, F-R-E-I-R-E. -E. No? Okay. Paolo, Paolo Freire wrote a book about education. It's called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Is it op the oppressed or oppression? Oppression. oppression? oppression? How do you know? You don't know. <laughs> it's either the... Po <laughs> See, this is how I undermine my own authoritarian position. The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, I think it's called. And what he's trying to prove in the 1960s is that education is there to make you stupid. Education is there basically to stop you from being able to think critically. Children, when they see things, they're naturally critical. They're always testing things, again, as if it's for the first time. Because they're figuring things out, they discover rules, consistencies, and they're making sure that this case also fits the rule. And if it doesn't fit the rule, what will the child do to the rule? They'll throw it out. So children are naturally critical. So what's the school system there to do? Drive it out of you. Stop questioning authority. So Paulo Freire in his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in the 1960s, develops the concept of the banking system, which is basically that I deposit knowledge in your account, and on test day, what do I want to do? I want to make a withdrawal. And it better be good. It better be what I said. I mean, it's much more complex than that, but it's something that was developed in a similar manner by Michel de Montan in the 16th century, a French uh, pedagogue, pedagogue who called, who, who called it the funnel system. We talked about this before, right? If I put X into your head, what do I want to come out of your mouth? X. What's your brain for? To transport X from, from here. Don't encourage her. That's probably true, that's probably true, because children are much more creative than their fathers. Okay, <laughs> she's gonna make fun of my drawings now. Okay, good. So, the point being that 
both Michel de Montan in the 16th century and Paulo Freire 50 years ago were describing the same thing that Zimbardo was talking about is education can be there and usually is there to make you stupid. By that he means enable to criticize, enable to do what you're born to do, which is constantly check what's being told to you, making sure that it's correct. Okay, so much for that. Okay, uh, reward moral behavior, which, what's the uh, key word there? Reward. What, what, what kind of moral behavior should we be, be rewarding? What, what is the most courageous form of moral behavior? <laughs> Whistleblowing. If an institution does not have a whistleblowing policy, it is not encouraging moral behavior. Because there always will be people who are breaking the rules, and what do we do about that? Okay, so one of the ways of objectively, in the Kohlbergian or Restian sense, of testing whether an institution is ethical or not, is whether it has policies in place which encourage whistleblowing. Okay. Respect for human diversity. I'm going to get another pen so that I can draw better. Blue, no. Let's see if uh, black works. OK. We talked about this before with respect to the glass ceiling. What is the glass ceiling? You have women, but in many countries also it's about diversity. The term here is diversity. It's not just about gender. It's also about language, religion, skin color, or, or disabilities. Or, and I never used to bring this up, but now it's in the, it's in the NDU anti-discrimination policy, so I guess I'll openly say it, sexual orientation. The new ethical ethics policy at NDU prohibits discrimination best, based on sexual orientation. I'm surprised it's in there, but that's, now that it's in there, I can say it too. See how chicken I am? So, <laughs> always hiding behind the, uh, the laws, right? <laughs> so, diversity can be many things, but what you notice is that whether it's gender, skin color, religion, language, or whatever, Normally, the people who do not belong to the normal crowd, who do not have the religion or skin color or gender of the people who are in power, they usually get stuck about halfway up the ladder. So, what does a real diversity policy require? Banning discrimination or affirmative action? Okay, since you answered that question, what does affirmative action mean? Try to uh, allow those people to have the, uh, only that they want is to call it uh, job to Good, okay. Uh, Details? I'm impressed uh, again. Uh, uh, regardless of their gender. Regardless of anything, uh, that uh, the person uh, choose the correct person for the correct uh, position. Uh, Okay, that's not going far enough. Uh, okay, what is the difference between, you, you can go back and take some pictures too, you, can, you don't have to just sit there. Of her and me and everything. <laughs> Move. <laughs> so, what, what is the difference, <laughs> this is on tape too. What is the difference between uh, anti-discrimination policies and affirmative action policies? Negative versus positive policies or approach. Negative means it is forbidden to discriminate against students because they are female or male. It is forbidden to give people an advantage because they belong to a certain religion or political party or whatever. These are negative. 
can we determine objectively whether policies on this exist? Yeah. You look into the bylaws of an institution. Are they there? Are they not there? Objectively, we can determine that. What is positive action? Po By the way, affirmative action is the American term. Positive action is the U EU term the, within the European Union. Positive action or affirmative action means that we have to have mechanisms in, pl in place to encourage. So what does that mean? How would you encourage diversity in the workplace, diversity in the university, diversity in housing or transportation? So posit positive action, and this is something again that can be tested empirically. Are there mechanisms in our university, knowing that half of the population is female, that half of the population on all levels are female? Can we determine whether those policies exist? We can. Either they're there or they're not, not there. How can we determine or find out whether the policies are meant seriously? How can we, how can we determine whether or not they're applied? How do, you how do you tell whether or not a policy is being executed or carried out? It's called, uh, this, is why, this is why the social sciences are also sciences. Uh, you do a baseline study. You say, okay, in the faculty of engineering, what percentage of the top professors are female? Top, top level. Associate and, and full professors are female. Zero. What, what percentage of the assistant professors are female? I'm assuming that in the engineering faculty, although it's the, you know, really the best faculty at the university and it's one, the one that fulfills all our dreams, guys, I'm assuming that you have the same problem we do in, in our faculty. The, as you go down in the hierarchy, the number of women goes up. The lab, the lab assistants will probably be more female, and the full professors, the, the chairman and the deans, will be men. Is that the case? OK, if that's the case, what would affirmative or positive action try to do? Encourage women to be present on all levels. How do you tell if a policy is being applied? You see it over, you can say, okay, 2014, let's now look between 2014 and 2024 and see if the number of women in the higher levels changes. Nor, you have to be quiet. Okay, so, affirmative action, diversity is of course applying. There are technical ways, there are statistical ways of testing this. to encourage an organization to reflect the reality in the society in which they live. It's very easy with gender. 50% approximately are male and female, which means that on all levels, you should find half men and half women. Why do you tend not to find women in leadership positions? The glass ceiling is just the way of, of, te of testing it or describing it. Why, what is the normal reason why we do not put women? Because of caring responsibilities. The woman is responsible for caring for the children and the elderly members, the old grandmother and grandfather, the sick aunt or whatever. So what's the easiest way to solve that problem? Babysitter, maid, let the state take care of it. What are we forgetting? In every family we have a, well not in every family, but in most families we have a mom and a dad. Dad, how about dad, right? Nobody thought of dad, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, work, life, balance means that an institution has mechanisms to encourage women to have flexibility to take care of children 
and the elderly or people who are sick. But it also has the exact same policies in place for men. Now, whether those policies are being implemented or not is easy to test. How many men are taking off to fulfill their responsibilities as working fathers? Now, why does that term sound silly? Working father. What? Why? What's the silly part? The silly part is the, is the father, right? <laughs> Working mothers means normally you're a mother and then because of some weird reason you decided to work, right? But working fathers doesn't make any sense. So what men are being robbed of is their right to fatherhood. So guys, let's get together and fight for our rights. <laughs> okay, now you, there we go, okay. This is, this is the way you can make men aware of the fact that the, the gender equality is also good for us. Okay, good. Change social conditions to promote an, 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 anonymity. Making people feel special and accountable can promote socially desirable actions. Okay, this is very, very important and it's a little bit difficult to do uh, technically. How do you make sure that the people who are making this, the decisions are held accountable? Where are most dis important decisions made in an institution? In the boardroom, in the boardroom, in the meetings where people are taking minutes, or on somebody's yacht, at the polo games, or in the sauna? <laughs> where do you think guys get together to make, to make decisions? On the golf course, right? On the golf course, right? So. A lot of women who are entering the workforce and working their way up, they learn how to play golf, they learn how to play polo, and they even, and there's interesting stories about this, they learn how to smoke cigars. Yeah. Women have actually done this. They've gone home and smoke, become cigar smokers because if you want to sit in a boardroom and make decisions when the guys are smoking cigars, it's easier to stand the smoke if you smoke too. Right, okay. So. Um, the, the attempt to make decisions formalized is, a, is one of the major, uh, if you will, major challenges or battles in many European countries that important decisions always have to be documented. If a decision is made to close down a plant or to change the requirements for promotion or whatever, there have to be minutes so that if you are ever unhappy, you can go back and say, where was that decision made? Who made it? I want to challenge it. Now that's, not, that's very, very difficult to do and most European countries are failing, but at least they're trying to solve that problem. Okay, then we uh, finally have challenge pressures for conformity, which means that if you're under pressure to go along, you will go along. So we have to promote, it's another, it's another way of saying promote diversity. We have to encourage different ways of doing things, of being, because of, of, of identity, I mean, one thing is my personal problems that I have because I belong to a group that's not normal. If I'm working in a company that's predominantly Sunni and I'm Orthodox, somehow I don't fit in. I was working, um, I'm working with somebody in, in Dahia. Uh, he's running a documentation center for the Civil War and it's the only farm left in Dahia. I told you about Umam. And I always wondered why this guy, Lokman Slim, his father was an MP, a Shia MP in the 60s, why he was so courageous and refused to sell his farm to the people, who, not, it wasn't political pressure, it was, it was economic pressure. They wanted to build high rises on his farm. It's in the middle of Dahia. And it turns out that his, he, he grew up in a Maronite environment in Dahia before the war, Maronite villages. His father was so it was, so it was Shia and his mother was Protestant. So, so he's already used to being weird, right? Uh, so that, that, that encourages resistance to pressure. So the conformity, the going along can be because of your, uh, your background, religiously, linguistically, skin color, but it also can be just your temperament, your disposition, your character. I was up in, I told you I was up in, in, Germany, in northern uh, uh, Lebanon and the guy, the guy who runs this center for the refugees, he's German. And he worked for a very long time for the European Parliament 
And he said he couldn't stand it because everything, everything was so regimented, it was so orderly. He loves living in Lebanon. And I said, I think what's happening here are there are a lot of people who, who grow up in Germany or Sweden or Holland whose characters are more Lebanese. So they suffer. And when they come here, they feel at home. They feel free. And then I know the opposite. There are people who grow up in Lebanon whose characters are more German. And they're always suffering. And then they go to Germany and they feel free <laughs> at home, right? So it can be dispositional. It can be because of who you are. Last point. Uh, refuse to sacrifice crucial freedoms for elusive, elusive promises of security. This obviously was the big issue after 9-11. The big issue after the destruction. You're encouraging this. Yes, you are. The big issue after the destruction of the World Trade Center was should the U.S. sacrifice its freedoms, its freedoms, for more security against terrorism. And what basically the US government did was to radically change the laws about security to prevent terrorism, and the US became much more of a police state. The second president of the United States, Jeff Thomas Jefferson, said, somebody who sacrifices freedom for security deserves neither. If you sacrifice your freedom for security, you'll lose both. OK. No, not thank you. Next reading. We have two more minutes. Next reading. One more minute. I have two. Linda Hill's article on exercising moral courage is due for Tuesday. Remember, this is a very, very practical chapter now with many examples about heroic leaders. And this is where we're going to find finally Franco Barnabe described, but also several examples in South Africa. And, and what what, what is the play on words exercising moral courage? Last point. Exercise means training, but it also means executing or carrying out. Okay, thank you. See you on Tuesday.